aircraft imaging, which is a very common procedure here at U.S. So the objective of this talk is to, to identify the normal appearance of the post-operative aorta and uh, diagnose the complications related to open aortic surgery and uh, stent graft treatment. Uh, as you know, uh, over the years, the, there has been evolution of the treatment of the aortic diseases, uh, which is not only done for the aneurysm, but also for the affections, pseudoaneurysms, ruptures, etc. Uh, the traditional method is the open surgical approach where uh, a prosthetic or a homograph is used by using two different techniques. Uh, lately, the endovascular stent graft treatment has become the uh, treatment of choice for many uh, conditions. And sometimes, especially for ascending aortic complex aneurysms and dissections, a combined stage procedure is used where you start with open surgical technique and followed by completion with endovascular stent graft. So there are two main surgical techniques. One is the interposition technique, which involves resection of the disease segment of the aorta, as shown here, and then placing a graft that is composed of synthetic textile fibers, usually DuPont or Dacron. So there is a no native aortic wall left. What you see is the graft. And this is a preferred technique because the complication rate is uh, lower as compared to the inclusion graft. Uh, if you do the sagittal oblique imaging, you will be able to see the graft itself is a straight tube rather than a normal curvature of the aorta. And also you can see the enforcement with the ferrocent pledges at the anastomotic sites. The inclusion graft technique uh, involves performing an aortotomy and placing a graft within the disease native segment of the aorta and the aortic wall is then again sutured on top of the graft. So what you will see is a graft within the wall of the uh, native aortic sac. And that sac may remain filled with contrast or thrombus, so it can be hyper attenuating or it can be low attenuating and gradually evolve over time. Uh, there are different surgical techniques for different part of the aorta. Uh, for ascending and aortic root repair, there are two methods. Either you replace the ascending aorta separately and the aortic root or aortic valve separately, or you can use a composite graft which includes the mechanical valve and the grafts of the ascending aorta itself. Uh, as you know, the aortic root has three main components. One is the annulus at the cusp uh, tips. Then you have the level of the sinuses, which is the maximum diameter at the sinuses of the Ansalva. And then you have the sinotubular junction. So this part is the aortic root and rest is the ascending aorta. The aortic valve replacement can be done by tissue valve uh, with or without stents. It can be porcelain or pericardial as shown here. The valve itself is not radiopaque, but the stents or the surge at the end are radiopaque. As you can see on this movie, uh, these are the end of the valve, but you can see the valve within the stud itself is not bent, so it may not be seen in the radiograph. Radiograph, what you will see is the three dots of the peripheral descent. Or you can have a mechanical uh, stent, uh, which can uh, be put on a CT. The second uh, procedure is the composite graft, where you replace the ascending aorta along with the aortic valve. For this procedure, the coronary arteries have to be re-implanted. What you do is you dissect the coronary arteries with the rim of the native aorta around it. It's called a button technique. And then re anastomos onto the uh, composite graft. Uh, by the way, these pictures are taken from a uh, few articles from the radiographics and AJR as shown here. Uh, for aortic arch, there are different techniques depending upon what is needed. So it can be either aortic arch, uh, entire arch, a part of the arch, or all three vessels, or one vessel which is involved. There is a special procedure called elephant trunk procedure, which is actually a co quite a common procedure, especially for dissected complex ascending aortic diseases. Uh, it is a two-stage procedure. The first stage involves repair of the ascending aorta and the aortic arch with uh, a uh, a graft which is then goes into the native descending aorta and the trunk is what stays within the graft itself. Here is the movie of the patient with a dissected aneurysm. You can see the native dissection of the descending aorta and these two limbs are the elephant trunk limbs which are hanging into the, uh, the disease vessels. 
The second stage will then involve uh, repairing the rest of the descending aorta, either with a stent graft attaching to these two limbs or a complete, completing the repair with the open uh, procedure. So goal of imaging for post-operative aorta, uh, first of all, you should know the details of the surgical procedure performed to avoid any pitfalls. Uh, and also, you should be able to recognize the normal appearance of post-operative aorta. I think this can very easily mimic pathology, so you should be able to see uh, and say that this is a normal finding and not abnormal. And of course, there are several complications uh, leading to uh, pseudo endocrine formations or hematomas and fistulas, and they usually for open surgery, the surveillance imaging is usually done at 3 and 12 months and then yearly after the surgery. So normal post-operative appearance of the aortic graft is that the graft itself looks like a hyper-dense wall on a non-contrast CT. You can see here a density of the wall. Uh, whereas with contrast, the wall may not be very well appreciated. Uh, then the, at the side of the nasmosis, you can see that you can uh, identify the pledges, which are the radio opaque markers at the end. These are done to uh, enforce the anastomotic site, and they will show the start and the end of the aorta. This is very nicely seen on the LAO oblique view of the uh, ascending aorta. Uh, as I said before, the felt rings and pledges sometimes can mimic uh, peri-aortic graft hematoma, uh, but it can be very easily identified if you have done a non-contrast CT, but even on, non on a contrast enhanced CT, you can identify by looking at the density. If you change the window and level, the density will be different, and of course, these will be seen mostly at the level of the anastomosis. Uh, Sometimes for the descending aorta, people also use intercostal patch, and that will also produce a button kind of appearance. So this is not a leak. This is a normal patch of the intercostal vessel, which has been re-implanted into the descending aorta. Uh, another uh, common problem is for the composite graft, where the coronary ostea, which are using a button technique, are re-implanted. There can be a focal dilatation at the anastomotic side, which can mimic the coronary artery origin aneurysm, which is not true. It is a normal finding for this procedure and not a PSA. Uh, not uncommonly, you will see the uh, small amount of kink in the graft, especially at the site where the graft is uh, either anastomoting with the native aorta or it is taking a curve, especially uh, in the ascending aorta and arch junction. These kinks are very common and should not be mistaken for focal dissection. If you oblique and look in the multiple oblique views, especially coronal oblique, you can clearly identify that this is a kink and not a dissection. Uh, this is another patient where there is a graft in the descending and abdominal aorta, and where it is most, there is a small kink. Uh, elephant trunk uh, itself can mimic like a dissection because you have two flaps which are dangling within the aortic aneurysm, and if you do not know the details of the surgery, this can be overcalled as a dissection. So always look in multiple planes and correlate with the surgical findings. Uh, sometimes uh, omental or bovine wraps are used to anas at the anastomotic size to reinforce those areas, and they can look like increased soft tissue density and can mimic a steady graft hematoma. But if you look at the density, most of these wraps have fat within it, and you can see sometimes the vessels will be curving around within the fat. The hematoma usually don't have any vessels. So these can be easily identified by looking at the density as well as the vasculature orientation around the graft. Uh, for the interposition graft, where the graft is within the native aorta, the sac around or the native aortic sac can mimic dissection um, or actually a PSA. And sometimes uh, the sac may remain hyperdense from a hematoma. Uh, or it can become hypodense as shown here, or rarely it can become contrast enhanced because uh, especially this was common for older procedures such as the Cabral procedure where they used to create a small shunting with the ventricles to decrease the tension. And so the contrast can actually flow back into the end aortic sac and can mimic as a PSA. Uh, 
So these should be uh, not be mistaken for abnormalities. Uh, over the time, the native aortic sac can actually shrink. Most of the time, it does shrink and rarely can get calcified, and it can be seen like this. Or sometimes, it, you can see a increased soft tissue density around the graft itself. So this is not a hematoma. This is a normal finding. So best thing would be to compare with prior imaging study and see the evolution of these uh, findings. The complications are rare, especially nowadays with the such advancement of the peri uh, uh, operative uh, anesthetic support uh, for these complicated patients. Uh, the important thing is that we do surveillance imaging to detect complications which often happen in asymptomatic patients. Okay, uh, these are the various complications which we we'll go over one by one. So imaging has a very critical role, not only in the preoperative evaluation or uh, guidance for preparing for surgical procedure, but also for detecting complications in the postoperative uh, period. Uh, this is an example of a patient who had a, a cardiac transplant, and this is a aortic an asthmatic site. This was a surveillance imaging study done with not without contrast, but you can see there was an excessive soft tissue density around it. There was no prior studies, uh, so we said, you know, this patient may need a contrast study because this is actually too much for uh, a patient who is status post operative procedure two years before. So the next day we did a contrast enhanced study, and uh, we did find that there was actually a contrast which is leaking out at the anastomotic site. Uh, this patient was not operative this time because of the high risk associated with his other comorbid conditions. He came back a month or a month and a half later. At that time, you can see the PSA actually is much larger, in fact, larger than the native aorta. At this time, he went to surgery, and uh, uh, they found that there was infection at the anastomotic site. Uh, graft kinks, as I showed you, are common, but sometimes if the kink is too much, it can cause obstruction to the flow. And uh, if you see on both the coronal and the oblique views, uh, there is a significant obstruction. This is just like a web you see in chronic TPE patients. Uh, this can cause significant hemodynamic consequences. In fact, this patient went on to surgery to repair this kink. Graft infection is very rare, only 2% of the uh, incidence. Uh, how you detect graft is either there is a perigraft soft tissue attenuation which gradually increase over time. Normally, the perigraph soft tissue hematoma, if it is not infected, it either stays the same or gradually decreases in size. But in this case, it actually de increased within three months period. And also, if you see gas around the graft, uh, especially near the anastomotic site, it indicates that their patients often have infection. Uh, Small amount of fluid, as I said before, is common, and it usually occurs due to inflammatory response to the foreign material, especially the bioglue, which is used as the anastomotic signs, or if the bovine pericardium is used, or sometimes a reaction to the graft itself. Here is a patient where we found a, a, a soft tissue density around the graft. This is a native graft. Uh, you can see the felt pledges here. Uh, so since we had the prior imaging, we pulled out the old study two years ago, and this soft tissue density was present. There's no change, so this is a normal stable perigraft uh, fluid collection, which usually do not require any kind of intervention. Uh, perigraft gas, if you can see, or a contrast extravasation, that usually indicates that there is a PSA and likely from infection. Uh, normally, within first few weeks, even up to six weeks, you can see small amount of gas or fluid around the post-operative side, depending upon how much trauma it was. But after six weeks, if you see air, that usually indicates either there's a gas-forming organism or there's a fissurous communication of the aorta with either the airway or the esophagus. Now, as I said before, air is not uncommon in early post-operative period. This is a patient who had a very complex procedure of the ascending aortic aneurysmal dissection. This is a preoperative CTA 3D view. And on the post op, the CT was done to evaluate for loculation of effusion, not for looking for gas. But in, in fact, if you look, there is a graft here, there is a petty graft hematoma, and a large amount of air. So if you are not sure, or residents on call, they often tend to call air 
hematoma, the patient had infection. No, this actually was not infected. And clinically, the wound was stable. There was no pus and there was no instability. So this patient ran on going home without any complications. So this is a normal finding. Remember, after six weeks, if you see this kind of picture, uh, it is abnormal. And of course, if you see the graft is crumbled like this, this is the abdominal aorta, and uh, there's a gas within the graft itself, of course, that is not normal at any time. Uh, Sometimes infection can develop uh, around the graft. This is a patient, a uh, 50-year-old, who had a repaired trachea fellow with a St. Jude aortic valve replacement and developed a pleuritic chest pain. A CTA of the chest was done for pulmonary embolism. Uh, so this is a non-gated study, but it, it turned out to be pretty good. You can see there is a prosthetic aortic valve, but there is a large amount of fluid around the graft. Actually, this fluid is actually infiltrating into the ventricular uh, left AV groove. Uh, surrounding the uh, circumflex artery. Uh, this is the anastomotic site of his native pulmonary artery where they put a graft. And in fact, uh, because this was an infection, a patient did have an infarct in the spleen. Uh, post property PSA, uh, this is the same patients I showed you, are not common, but they can be detected uh, incidentally on a surveillance uh, CT. This was the baseline CT of the patient. Uh, after heart transplant, which has developed a soft tissue density around it. So baseline, uh, open synoptic wound, a lot of hematoma, uh, but no mass effect. Uh, this gradually increased over time, and at this time, this patient underwent surgery. So remember, PSA can be totally asymptomatic and detected only on surveillance imaging. Uh, however, anastomotic leaks can develop either at the proximal anastomosis, there's a big leak, there's a big neck of the ascending aorta, at the level of right-hand coming artery, which is a PSA uh, attached to the graft, or it can develop at the distal anastomotic sites. Usually, uh, they are uh, due to some kind of violent coughing or uh, actually more commonly due to infection. Uh, patients who have a bout of excessive cough can develop uh, anastomotic leaks. Sometimes leaks can also be seen at the site of aortic cannulations, <coughs> uh, especially for the aortopulmonary, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass procedures. <coughs> Sometimes PSA can be slowly expanding, and this is one area which can be difficult to evaluate. Uh, here is a good example of a 59-year-old who had a neotic valve replaced. It was a composite valve, and this is a graph I showed you before, a non-contrast CT graph can have a very high attenuation and can be easily identified. And as you can see, around the graph, there is a uh, heterogeneous density, uh, probably a fresh blood, and this is the sac around it. Uh, but there is no mass effect on it. So this can be a normal post-operative finding. We did not know the details. The patient came for chest pain. There was no other findings. The patient was sent back. Uh, he came back two months later, so this is uh, July and this is uh, September. Uh, you can see if, uh, the soft tissue density uh, around the uh, aortic graft has increased. In fact, there's a mass effect is forming the anterior lateral wall of the aorta uh, compared with the previous study here and uh, correlated with the coronal imaging. So at this time, contrast was given, and you can see there is a slight increased density, so we are not sure whether... <coughs> Contrast is actually leaking out, or this is just a hematoma, which is hypertense. Even at this stage, nothing was done because the patients, these patients are high risk patients. You know, they don't, nobody wants to touch them because they carry a lot of uh, mortality with the operation. So the patient was again sent back with the uh, coming back a few days later. This is 99, this is 916. At this time, we decided that we will do a non con CT first, with low dose non con CT followed by a CTA, and then a delayed CT to look for if there's a leak. In fact, if you look, the max set has further increased. In fact, there was a slow leakage to the contrast, which is better appreciated on the delayed imaging. So here is a composite of three scans, which we did. Hematoma is gradually increasing, and there is a contrast which is accumulating, and there is more and more mass effect. The patient was actually went on surgery, and they did not find any infection. This was just a slow and asthmatic leak, which was causing the problems. <coughs> uh, management of these PSA can be controversial. Uh, it depends upon several factors, the absolute size of the PSA and its change over time, and uh, how close it is to the aortic valve and the branch vessels. 
and more importantly, the patient is clinically symptomatic or not. Uh, sometimes a small PSA, even if it's enhancing, they can remain stable for years, uh, especially if you look at the angiographic data. This is not an uncommon finding to find contrast slowly outside leaking around the aortic graft. And these patients can be uh, obviously managed conservatively. Graft fistulas are actually very, very rare. I have never seen it. This is from that same article with Meridian Graphics. Uh, uh, you can identify uh, clinically if the patient starts having hemoptysis or hematemesis, and there is no other cause identified if the patient has a aortic graft placement. On imaging finding, you might see a contrast extravasation, or very rarely you might see the fistulas track itself opacified, and because they are communicating with the air containing structure, they will be somewhere on the air around the graft. Again, if this, these two findings are present uh, and the patient is symptomatic with those symptoms, I think it's very, very suggestive that there is a fish of the graft with those uh, structures containing air. Uh, very rarely, this is one recent case, you can develop post-operative anastomotic stricture or stenosis. Uh, usually, if there is excessive trauma at the time of surgery and there is a fibrotic response. This is the LAO view, 15-year-old graft to repair uh, in a child. Uh, who develop now decreased uh, pulses and uh, blood flow to the upper extremity. And if you look at the distal anastomotic side, there is excessive soft tissue density, which is just like a web. It is partly calcified and it is at the anastomotic side, which is causing uh, stenosis, significant stenosis, behaving like a cooperation. Uh, this is an isogenic cooperation. This needs to be treated. And this can be treated either with the open surgical repair or they can in even do a endoscent treatment. <clears throat> Moving on to the endoscent uh, treatment, uh, it is now an alternative to surgery for various pathologies. Uh, not only it started as a descending, uh, actually abdominal aortic uh, aneurysm treatment, but now it is uh, also a treated, used for descending aortic aneurysm, penetrating ulcers, pitch loss, sometimes even for myocardic aneurysms, post-traumatic aortic dissections and ruptures, uh, and of course for co-optations. The advantages of endoscents are many. Uh, it is less invasive, less painful, uh, associated mortality and morbidity is less. There's a shorter hospital stay, and uh, uh, it can be done in patients who are hemodynamically unstable for open surgery, and there is less blood loss. Uh, the downside is that they are much more uh, costly procedure. The stents are very, very expensive, and I'm not sure how much uh, these procedures are being done in India. Uh, and you do need a suitable anatomy for the attachment of the grafts. Uh, at this time, uh, uh, there is no long-term, you know, 10, 20-year data outcome is available, but whatever short-term data is there, it, it has a very good uh, outcome. Uh, the lifelong follow-up is needed, and also many of these patients often need uh, uh, contrast study, which can lead to nephropathy. So the goal of the endovascular aortic aneurysm repair is to exclude the blood flow within the aortic sac while maintaining the flow distally, okay? Uh, it also decreases the pressure transmitted to the aneurysmal wall, and that leads to decrease in the aortic wall rupture. Uh, as with any preoperative endostent treatment, uh, you have to do a, some kind of imaging study, and CTA right now is the preferred method because it can show you nicely, and because of the best spatial resolution, you can do the 3D reconstruction, which are very, very useful for the surgeons to uh, look at. Uh, so always describe any branch vessel involvement uh, in, in thoracic aorta, uh, the neck vessels. Uh, if there is any significant angulation of the aorta, uh, of course, the diameter and length of the aneurysm and the extent uh, and the presence, where is the calcification, how much is the aortic wall calcification. Uh, typically, more than one centimeter of the normal aortic valve is required, addition to the abnormal aortic aneurysm wall, and that there should be at least uh, four uh, centimeter or less diameter of the proximal and distal aortic necks. Uh, usually, after endostent, you follow up with CPA3, six and 12 months and then yearly afterwards. Of course, this can be different if the patient developed symptomatic symptoms or if the surgery was more difficult and they anticipate complications, uh, this duration can be changed. So open surgery is usually three months and 12 months, here three months, six months and 12 months and then yearly afterwards. 
Uh, the goal of imaging uh, after the endostent repair is that to confirm and re-document the appropriate placement of the graft stent. Okay. Uh, if it is done for a leaking aneurysm, it, it, that area should be covered with the graft. Uh, effectiveness of the stent, uh, by looking at the flow in the sac, there should not be any flow or very decreased flow as compared to the previous study. Uh, Long-term follow-up, we always measure the aortic sac to look at whether it is uh, normal, uh, stable in size, or as it decreases. Usually, usually, it should not increase in size with time. Uh, sometimes, very rarely, you may detect stent graft mechanical failure, that either the stirrups are broken uh, or the grafts then become displaced. And, of course, the most common uh, complication is the endo leak, which we'll discuss in a minute. So let's look at the various indications. Uh, aortic aneurysms. Uh, aneurysm is defined as a localized or diffuse dilatation of more than 50% of the normal diameter of the thoracic aorta. It will be supplied to any aneurysm in the body. Uh, in the thoracic aorta, more than 4.5 centimeter is aneurysmal, but if it is more than 6 centimeter, then there is a significant risk of rupture. Okay? So people often say if this, if this aneurysm is not up to 6 centimeter, they will wait not to operate. Okay? So it depends again. They are based on the comorbid conditions of the patient. Uh, aneurysm of the descending aorta is the most common in the thoracic aorta, followed by ascending, and then least commonly is the aortic arch. Uh, overall, the abdominal aortic aneurysms are much more common as compared to the uh, thoracic aortic aneurysm. The lifetime probability of the rupture of the thoracic or thoracoabdominal aneurysm is 75 to 80%, with five-year survival of untreated uh, uh, patients is only 10 to 20%, so it is very significant. Uh, presentations of these aneurysms are more commonly is asymptomatic, discovered incidentally by ultrasound for abdominal is, uh, uh, aortic aneurysm or with uh, CT done for some other reason, the, uh, the descending or ascending aortic aneurysm is detected. Uh, rarely you can find uh, on physical examination there is a brewery uh, or on radiographs there is a dilatation of the aorta. Uh, less commonly, the patient can present with chest pain, especially if there is a dissection or significant dilatation uh, or sometimes from peripheral embolization, either uh, from TIA to the brain emboli or bowel or extremity exenia. Uh, to the lower extremity. Uh, rarely in mycotic aneurysm, patient may have a systemic symptoms of infection, such as any other infection. The dreaded complications are uh, commonly of the dissection and uh, gradual expansion and rupture. The thoracic aortic aneurysms expand at a rate of 0.43 centimeter per year. Uh, uh, if it is faster and as the aneurysm size increases. So after five centimeters, this rate increases. That's why you have to keep it watch uh, on a larger aneurysm by doing a frequent study. Rupture of the thoracic aortic aneurysm is more frequent as compared to the abdominal aortic aneurysm, uh, which is more commonly found. Uh, patients, as I said, could be asymptomatic, but they can become symptomatic. And if these patients develop symptoms because of rupture, the outcome is usually poor. Uh, so what are the indications for repair of the uh, aortic aneurysm? If the growth rate exceeds one centimeter per year, if the aneurysm becomes symptomatic, uh, if the size is more than 5.5, some people say more than 6 for ascending and 6.5 for descending aorta, or it can be done earlier in patients who have familial uh, history of aneurysm or have clearly a connective disorder such as malfunction. Uh, because these patients are at a much higher risk for developing complications, so they can be operated at a smaller size and earlier. The atherosclerotic aneurysms are typically seen in elderly uh, patients and that they who also have comorbid conditions, especially hypertension and COPD, and the aorta is often diffusely abnormal. So uh, these can be somewhat tricky to treat. Uh, uh, because these, uh, there is uh, more vector forces uh, which tend to elongate the aneurysm and therefore the stent graft migration is more common with atherosclerotic aneurysms. Therefore the recommended landing zone at the ends is usually more than 2 centimeter, uh, more than what is normally required for other non-atherosclerotic endoscent treatment. 
Uh, here is an example of a sacular aneurysm of the aortic arc, actually descending aorta just beyond the original the subclavian artery, which was treated with the endostent. Uh, this aneurysm was actually causing mass effect on the adjacent trachea and esophagus, and after the stent graft treatment, that mass effect has also disappeared. Now, uh, there are various varieties of the grafts which are available. There can be penetrations to allow blood flow into the subclavian artery. If that cannot be done, then patients actually, if the subclavian can be sacrificed. They can tie this off and communicate a graft or jump graft between the common carotid and subclavian to preserve the flow to the upper extremity. It, it, it's not an uncommon procedure, but it can be done. Uh, example of penetrating ulcer, again, uh, not difficult to treat uh, because these false aneurysms are actually short and uh, they have a relatively normal uh, proximal and distal uh, anastomotic site. So here an example of a leak in the descending aorta and once it is covered, uh, there's uh, no leak is noted after the procedure. Uh, traumatic aortic ruptures uh, usually occur from deacceleration injury. Uh, ideally, the surgical treatment interposition graft is a standard treatment, but in patients who are poor surgical uh, candidates, uh, especially with the very severe other organ injuries, uh, these patients can be treated with endostent. But now we are seeing a trend towards even in, in good surgical candidates, patients are opting for endostent treatment because of the various advantages we uh, discussed earlier. Uh, especially in younger patients, this can be controversial because these patients often need long-time uh, anticoagulation. So patients can debate that, you know, younger patients will need long-term coagulation, anticoagulation which has its own side effects. Uh, we discussed this before. Uh, here is a good example of a distal uh, descending thoracic aortic injury from car uh, accident. This is at the level of the aortic hiatus. You can see the wall of the aorta is thickened and there's an intraluminal filling defect. It is seen on both the coronal and the axial views. This patient was treated with endostent. It was a small stent uh, across this area and he, this is a follow-up CT after uh, three months and the stent is well preserved and there is no leak and this patient is doing well actually. Uh, this is we discussed before. Uh, this is one of the complications. If the aneurysm is large and it is causing compression of the airway, you can treat this with the endostent and on follow-up, the native sac uh, around the stent can also collapse and can uh, produce a variable appearance. Uh, patients who develop uh, fish loss between the aorta uh, and airway or es esophagus, uh, these can also be now easily treated. In fact, the risk of Infection with the graft procedure is less than the open surgery because the stent graft is actually separating the, the aortic itself, aorta from the mediastinal of tissue uh, by the intact uh, aortic wall. Uh, mycotic aneurysm, we have seen uh, quite a few cases. This is a good example. Uh, mycotic aneurysm needs to be treated urgently uh, because there is a significant risk of rupture because these aneurysms uh, grow very rapidly. Here is a good example. Patients who uh, has MRSA and uh, we found a on a regular CT of the chest, uh, there is a aneurysm or PSA of the descending aorta in August of 2009. Uh, in a in, in, in month and a half, uh, this aneurysm actually grew very rapidly. So this patient uh, is a good candidate for treatment. Uh, ideally, uh, the treatment usually is done uh, open surgically, uh, uh, but nowadays uh, actually it is a favorable uh, procedure is endostent, either a permanent repair or uh, to gain time to, to improve patient's symptoms because these patients are, have a very severe generalized sepsis and they are not a good surgical candidate. So uh, this patient uh, was treated with endostent and here is a, a angiographic appearance of the, the PSA, a mycotic aneurysm, and after the uh, procedure, the leak uh, or flow into the PSA has significantly decreased. So mycotic aneurysms uh, are becoming a common indication for endovascular treatment, either permanent repair or uh, temporary repair while the patient is recovering from severe sepsis. Uh, for Stanford type B dissections, we normally don't treat them. This is a medical uh, conservative treatment unless there are complications such as uh, there is rupture of the aneurysm, 
uh, rupture of the dissection or the false aneurysm is has grown larger or patients is having refractory hypertension or there is organ ischemia uh, in the abdomen or there is uh, persistent pain from dissection. So those are the common, uh, not common, but uncommon uh, complications which may require treatment of a type B aortic dissection. As we know, the mortality rate for surgical repair of a chronic type B is 15% uh, in comparison to uh, 40% for acute dissections. Now, these numbers may have actually improved over the years now with a much improved, refined surgical technique. Uh, stent grafts are very effectively used for organ ischemia and for treating especially the false human aneurysms. Uh, as you know, in 15 to 20 percent of type B early dissection, uh, within the four to five years, the false human actually gradually increase in time. So that can lead to aneurysm and its complications. Uh, important thing to remember when you are putting a stent in these patients, you do not want to excessively dilate because of the aortic wall is already uh, weak and it can cause rupture. Uh, aortic co-optation can be easily treated with endostent. Ideally, uh, or traditional approach is either putting a patch or a interposition graft, but nowadays an endostent is an option. This is a patient who had a small endostent placed for the aortic graft placement and he's doing quite well actually. Uh, since it is a less invasive procedure, uh, no stenotomy or pericotomy is required. Younger patients often go for this. Uh, what are the complications of endostent? Uh, you can have a general complications for any major procedure uh, or acute specific complications related to the endostent. Uh, because the access uh, vessel damage can occur uh, because the delivery systems are very large, 25 French or more, uh, approximately uh, eight centimeter in diameter, I think this can, can be a big problem. Uh, there can be a side branch occlusion or sometimes distal embolism because there can be a neural thrombus which can get dislodged while doing uh, the procedure. Now, all these complications are usually obvious at the time of repair, okay? Uh, but what is more important for us, uh, the radiologists who image these patients, is the late complications. Uh, the most common is being the endoleak, uh, the aneurysm sac expansion, uh, or a stent migration, really stent can collapse and of course you can have a PSA perforations, kinking, etc. So let's look at the commonest complications. The endoleak is actually a persistent blood flow within the aneurysmal sac outside the lumen of the endoprosticity. So this is a patient who has a descending thoracic aortic aneurysm which was repaired by stent and you can see there is a contrast which is outside the lumen into the native aortic sac. Okay, so this is a type of endoleak. Now there are four or five different types of endoleak. I'll go over each one by one. The type one endoleak usually occur at the anastomotic sites, either proximal or distal, or in case of aortoiliac, it is uh, the one C. So they can be classified as one A for proximal, one B distal, and for a downo aortic one C. Uh, these are the most common type of endoleaks you see for endothoracic stent treatment as compared to the type 2 leak which is more common with the abdominal aortic endostent treatment. Okay? Uh, these are often associated with risk of rupture because the contrast is going into the sac and it is actually going to increase the sac diameter including uh, leading to risk of rupture and therefore these needs to be repaired immediately uh, either you can do, put a, another stent, cover the, that area of the leak, uh, uh, or sometimes you can embolize if there is a feeding vessel, uh, but covering a stent most of the time works quite well. Rarely these patients may end up going to open surgery if the covering a stent don't work. The type 2 leak is the, when there is a retrograde flow through the branch vessel, or thoracic, uh, uh, or abdominal aortitis, right, usually the internal uh, lumbar artery or the intercostal artery, okay, uh, this is intercostal. Uh, a number of uh, branches and amount of thrombus in the sac actually uh, de determine whether there is a risk of endoleak or not. Uh, as I said before, this is the most common type of uh, uh, endoleak for abdominal aortic endostent treatment. Uh, 
uh, as compared to type 1 for the thoracic. Uh, treatment for this is controversial. In fact, many of these we, we see quite often these leaks, and uh, these patients are not always treated. Uh, in fact, if you follow these, uh, if the sac does not increase in size, uh, most of these ultimately crumbles and spontaneously close. Uh, or if you have to treat it, they can be done by transarterial uh, occlusion of the branch vessel, or sometimes you can directly puncture the endoleic site and close it with uh, coils or uh, other structures. The type 3 endoleak is due to the structure failure of the stent graft, whether there is a hole in the fabric or there is a fracture or where the multiple overlapping stents are there, there is separation. So that leads to uh, uh, endoleak. And UV occurs from repetitive stresses from the arterial pulsation. And uh, as the native aortic sac shrink over time, it creates additional forces on the graph itself, and that can lead to such distortion, fragmentation, or anastomotic dehiscence. Uh, and also, again, there is an increased risk of rupture, and uh, these needs to be treated, again, very easily treated. You can put another cover stent within a stent, and that's it. Uh, mechanical failures uh, can be easily detected on a radiograph. Uh, if you do an oblique view, you can see the search, or, of course, you can do the reformats, uh, 3D reformats on the CTA and detect these third fractures. Uh, here is a good example of a patient who has a third fracture. Uh, this should be a movie which is not saying. Anyway, uh, you can do all these fancy techniques, go within the lumen and see where there's a strut which is fractured or not. The type 4 endoleak is usually due to the graft porosity. Uh, it is uncommon and it is often identified at the time of implantation. After the implantation, they usually do a run and you will see a blush around the uh, aortic graft stem, and that is due to the graft porosity. Uh, and this is usually occur in patients uh, who are fully anticoagulated. And once you treat the coagulation profile, this will gradually over goes away. So this type of leak is not seen uh, on imaging study, but it's usually seen at uh, in the perioperative period. The type 5 endoleak, which is also known as endotension, actually is, is more difficult to determine or to detect. Uh, this is actually an expansion of the aneurysm without definitive endoleak detected on any kind of imaging study. The hypotheses are several for this uh, phenomena. Uh, some people say this is an awful existing type 1 to type 3 endoleak, which you are, we are not able to see. That leads to gradual expansion of the aneurysm or there can be ultra filtration of the blood across the stent graft, again not seen on the imaging study, or there can be thrombus in the sac providing ineffective barrier to the pressure transmission, or there can be a low grade infection gradually leading to expansion. So none of these hypotheses are either confirmed, but this kind of leak is difficult to detect. So the best thing for us to do would be to confirm with multiple imaging studies and compare with old studies to see if the sac is expanding. Uh, and it, it often, if it is confirmed that definitely it is expanding, uh, this often required open repair. So here is a summary of different endoleaks. Type 1 at the anastomotic sites, most common in the thoracic aorta, there is risk of rupture. Type 2 from the collateral vessels, okay, uh, more common in the abdominal aorta can be easily treated or may be observed. Type 3, graft failure, usually due to structural problems, there is a risk of rupture treated with overlapping stent graft. Type 4, graft wall porosity due to excessive anticoagulation seen at the time of uh, placement of the graft, and so transit phenomena will go away uh, once you treat the coagulation. Type 5 is endotension, usually required open surgical repair once it is confirmed that sure, this is truly an endotension. Uh, rarely the stent can collapse. This is a good example of patients who had a stent, follow-up stent, you will see that stent is actually collapsing within the lumen. Again, the treatment would be to go inside, do the angioplasty, move the stent, and put another stent within it. Uh, here is a patient, the same patient went on putting a, a, another stent within it, but he developed a leak, type 1 leak at the proximal anastomosis. Now, he end up going to the surgery. Uh, putting a graft, this is the native aorta, and this was a graft, 
and ultimately doing well after treatment. So follow-up recommendations of imaging are usually at one month, three months, six months, 12 months, and then yearly, and uh, definitely these patients after investment require lifelong surveillance. So what are the techniques uh, of surveillance? Radiographs are very common uh, to detect these third fractures. Uh, it can detect any kinks also. Uh, CTA is actually most commonly used. It will, uh, it will detect the endoleaks and various other complications. Some people, in fact, do multi-phase CTs for looking for a slowed leak, which can be detected on delayed CTs. MR has a limited role because uh, of, depend upon the stent graft material used. Uh, many of these are nitinol stents. Uh, they can be uh, imaged with the MR. However, the other stents, stainless cell or elegoy, will cause a lot of uh, artifacts and can obscure the lumen. Uh, this is an example of a endo stent which was repaired and there is an enosomal sac uh, distension. Uh, on uh, the uh, T1 post contrast, you can see there was no leak, but there was a high uh, signal intensity in the enzyme sac on the actual SSFP, suggesting that this was actually an endo tension. This was on serial emitting study, so this patient required an open surgical repair. Ultrasound similarly has a very limited role uh, in the thoracic aorta. In abdominal aorta, sometimes you can see the endo leak. There is a patient who had an asthmatic type 1 leak. Uh, uh, this is the stent and this is the uh, perioperative endo aortic sac, and you can see the uh, flow jet across the type 1 leak. Uh, in fact, we try to, uh, uh, to do the thrombin injection to the stent. This worked for a while. It was temporarily relieved, but this again reoccurred because the pressure within the stent actually is much higher. Uh, so this did not work. So this patient ended up uh, getting open surgery. Uh, sometimes you can do a contrast study. Here's an example from uh, uh, literature. Uh, two limbs of the aorta and the contrast is leaking out, showing the, uh, and, uh, uh, the leak. Uh, and actually, people have shown that contrast enhanced ultrasound using tissue harmonics may be quite useful for the type 5 endotension leaks, uh, which are difficult to detect. So in conclusion, uh, for open surgical procedures, you should know the details of the procedure, be aware of the normal post-operative appearance of the aortic aneurysm sacs, etc., and uh, one must detect complications early uh, by doing surveillance imaging, and always compare with the old exam. That will help a lot. For stent drafts, follow, up, follow the stent protocol, uh, look for the stent position, any patency, any stirred disruption, sac distension, endo leak, etc. With that, thank you very much.